super weird time to be looking at psychology and technology. And um, the digital public square is really in flux. Um, and it seems like there are seeds for many possible futures uh, that could lie ahead of us. And those futures concern um, not just our digital lives, um, but also our material lives. As the pandemic is raging on, as threats to democracy persist and spread, and as the climate crisis grows ever more urgent, and of course the digital and the material are not totally separable, right? So online misinformation and political discord hosted and amplified in these digital spaces exacerbated all of these crises. Now the origin of the word crisis. Are we still okay? Good. The origin of the word crisis comes from late Middle English, denoting the turning point of a disease towards death or recovery. And before that, the ancient Greek crisis, meaning decision. I believe that psychologists and scientists who study psychology, technology, and culture can help guide the decisions that we need to make during this turning point of the world we live in right now. And I'm hoping that we can all think together today and moving forward about how we can conceptualize the moment that we're in and the role of science in moving us through this. My starting point comes from the biologist E.O. Wilson, who famously ascribed the problems of humanity to paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. And this idea has guided the work of many scholars who are working to understand the intersection of psychology and technology, including my own work. So my talk today is going to be in two parts. The first part is going to largely agree with Wilson's claim. And the second part is then going to question some of its assumptions. And I'll be, as I said, I'll be focusing um, a lot on theory. Um, I'm hoping to get through the content as quickly as I can so we can have time for discussion. And this is all work in progress. So um, if I get anything wrong, um, and if you have any work that's relevant to cite in these papers that are, are, are ongoing, please send them to me. So my basic argument in the first part of the talk, which is joint work with Billy Brady, Joshua Jackson, and Jim Lindstrom, um, is as follows. The idea is that algorithms exploit human social learning mechanisms and adaptive learning biases, and in doing so, have the potential to disrupt the collective benefits of those biases. And this argument aligns with Wilson by exploring how technology impacts these well-documented, presumably ancient, culturally universal aspects of social cognition. <laughs> One implication of this work, and Wilson's view more broadly, I think, is that if we can simply understand how human cognition works, then we can design our technologies around it to deal with the crisis that we are facing. The second part of the talk, which is joined with William Brady, uh, suggests that the solution might not be so simple. And designing uh, tech around our paleolithic emotions might actually lead us astray. Um, so here I'll consider the possibility that technology doesn't just exploit the social cognitive biases that we already have. It might also be creating new ones. And so we can't always assume that our emotional responses are paleolithic. They might be very modern and deep, shifting and evolving, evolving at a rapid pace. And this has some implications for how we should be asking research questions and designing our interventions. So we know that humans are prodigious social workers. We learn not just through trial and error, through interacting with the world, but also through observing other people and also through communication and through direct teaching. And this capacity for social learning is thought to explain a lot of the success of humans and species because it gives us capacity for culture. We rely on the knowledge, not just from people who are alive today, but also from past generations. And there's an interplay between our genetic adaptations and our cultural adaptations. Um, so, for example, it's thought that we have especially large brains to enhance our ability to learn from other people. But we don't just learn from others indiscriminately. Rather, we have a number of biases to learn about particular types of content and to learn from particular types of individuals. So content biases and context biases. And these biases include, for example, learning particularly from social information, emotionally arousing information, negative information, moralized information, and learning to copy people who are successful, who are prestigious, in-group members, and behaviors that are common. 
And these biases towards content and context are super adaptive. So, for example, bias attention towards negative information helps you avoid danger. Attending to moral information helps you avoid social punishment. It also helps groups cooperate better. And copying successful and prestigious individuals um, is kind of a shortcut towards learning those behaviors and strategies that are already been proven to be successful. Okay, so enter social media, which you know uh, has a business model that depends on holding our attention. The more time we spend online, the more money we generate for the platforms. And I'm not going to belabor this point. I think it's pretty well established, and I probably don't need to convince anyone here, especially of this. But what I do want to do now is just draw an explicit connection in between the idea that social media algorithms are optimizing for engagement and the literature that I just briefly summarized about what kinds of information and we're most likely to attend to. So if you design an algorithm to optimize engagement, it kind of follows that it's going to amplify information that grabs the attention of your population of users. And research from the past decade or so has now demonstrated a striking correspondence between content and context that trigger adaptive social learning biases on the one hand, and the type of information that generates the most engagement on social media. So we know that on social media, there's more engagement for emotional aspect of arousing content, especially when it is negative or alarming. Moral, normative, righteous content gets more engagement. Content for prestigious, successful, high status, dominant actors and content from in-group members that triggers groupish, parochial, tribal thinking. So you might have noticed I listed a lot of synonyms here, and the reason I'm doing this is I'm trying to come up with an acronym that will summarize all of these types of content that tends to be able to find on social media. Um, I have a few ideas. Uh, because we're in Germany, I will start with my personal favorite, Angst. Social media amplifies a rather normative, gloomy, successful tribal information. Uh, we could also go with mean content or panic. So if you have any ideas or feedback on which of these you like, um, please let me know. Um, because we're here in Germany, I will use Angst throughout the rest of this talk as just like a, a, a placeholder for the types of content that are listed here that should be very well adapted social media practices. Okay, so what I want to argue is that social media algorithms amplify function by exploiting social, media, social learning mechanisms in three ways. First, through direct amplification. So algorithms just promote content in news feeds that taps into these adaptive learning biases. Second, um, through observational learning. So after this content is amplified uh, and spreading in users' individual news feeds, then users are, are copying that content and producing more of it themselves. And finally, through reinforcement learning, algorithms show users' content to those audiences who are most likely to engage with it, give positive social feedback, uh, and then through reinforcement learning, to directly uh, induce users to produce more of that content themselves. Okay, so I've already kind of shared um, the literature showing evidence for the direct amplification mechanism. Um, so next, I will share briefly a recent set of studies from our lab that provide evidence for mechanisms to. So my team that was led by Billy Brady, who is now an assistant professor at Calumet Northwestern, um, as well as my PhD student, Kelly McLaughlin, um, used supervised machine learning to develop a digital outreach classifier um, that, can, that can detect automatically expressions of moral outrage in social media events. So it takes a bunch of tweets, you put it in, and it gives back the probability that an individual tweet is either outrage or not outrage. Um, this work is published if you want to know more of the details of that work, but it does really well, and it does just as well as um, human judgments. And then we constructed data sets that would allow us to test the hypotheses that users learn to express more outrage over time through both observational learning processes and reinforcement learning processes. So to do this, we first identified users um, whose tweets appeared in the training set, in the data sets that we used to train our classifier. Um, so they had, they had tweeted about issues that generated public outrage. 
Um, we then uh, scraped their tweet history. Um, this gave us about 12 million tweets from about 7,000 individual users. Um, we gathered the metadata, the likes and retweets for each tweet, um, and also apply our classifier to each tweet. So this gives us for each individual user in our data set, uh, a trajectory of up to 3,000 tweets, uh, whether each tweet contains outrage and how much social feedback each tweet received. Um, we also importantly collect information about the social networks of the users in our data set, um, their friends and followers, their ideological extremities, and, um, and so on. So we hypothesize that users will learn to express more outrage over time by matching their expressions to what they infer is normative among their peers through observation. So you can imagine networks might vary in their overall level of outrage or ideological extremity, and newcomers to the network might observe this and then match or adjust their expressions to what they perceive to be as the group norm. So as outrage propagates through social networks, individuals learn through observation that outrage expression is appropriate and then they become more likely to express outrage in the future. We also hypothesize that users would learn to express more outrage over time through direct social feedback, through their outrage expressions, getting the likes and retweets from their networks. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're working off a really simple model where a stimulant um, triggers an outrage response, which then generates outcomes of likes and retweets, which then directly reinforce, increase the future probability of expressing outrage in the future. So I'll just summarize our results as I have the papers published so you can read more details there. Um, we do find evidence for observational learning. We find that individual users are more likely to express outrage in networks where outrage is common. We also find evidence for reinforcement learning. So the amount of rewards you get for expressing outrage today positively predicts future outrage, especially when the rewards are higher than expected when they generate prediction errors, which we know to be an important component of reinforcement learning. Um, and we find this both in these naturalistic observations of, of Twitter users, as well as in two pre-registered behavioral experiments uh, in a, a simulated Twitter environment where we can play around with these pieces and make causal inferences about these processes. Okay. So just to summarize so far, it's not just that algorithms cherry pick and amplify the content that is most likely to grab our attention through these adaptive social learning biases, content that's arousing, normative, gloomy from individuals who are successful and in one's own tribe. The algorithms also create conditions that teach users themselves through both observation and reinforcement to create more of this content themselves by showing that content to audiences that predicts will reward users for it and um, also for uh, through just certain direct observation. And the further piece of this, which you know kind of follows, is that to the extent that users are learning to post the kind of content that grabs other people's attention, they then gain in followers and prestige, which then again sort of triggers more loops of these social learning biases. And these feedback loops, I think, are very difficult to escape. So you might be thinking, well, you know, this is how other people use social media, but I'm really good at control of my own use. Um, and I just think this about my own. So like, oh, I study this stuff, um, so I should be able to uh, to escape it. Um, but I read a blog post that was published last year um, that gives one of the best explanations I've seen um, from the computational social scientist Simon Dedeo um, was explaining why he left social media. And um, the, the title of the post is called The Algorithm Will Find You. And um, the whole post is worth reading in full, but I'm just going to share a few quotes to capture sort of the things that I worry about in this dynamic. The algorithm will find you has two parts to it. On the one hand, the algorithm will find you, meaning that it will discover you as a source for others, and then, and then direct them to you in potentially disturbing ways. On the other hand, the algorithm will find you, meaning that it will discover how to keep you online, regardless of the cost. And as I've shown, these two pieces work together, right? There are these spirals and feedback loops, 
where again, it is grabbing your attention, keeping you online. It gives you new degree content that will keep other people online. Those other people that need to hear your stuff and keep you online, and so on and so forth. The goal is to figure out how to keep you online, how to create the circumstances under which you are kept online, and how to shift your own preferences and behaviors in order to make achieving the first two goals easier and more decisive. And this third goal, making you into a person with different values, doesn't have to be an explicit goal of the system. It's just what happens when you build a really good reinforcement algorithm. And so by using these methods to keep all of us online, there's a worry that algorithmic amplification just disturbs the function of these social learning biases that were adapted in the environment in which they evolved, going back to E.O. Wilson, right? But now might be less well suited for promoting cooperation and cultural evolution for knowledge production and innovation and so on. So social learning biases are only adapted in environments where the information that we're biased to learn about tells us something meaningful about the world. But this can be maladapted in environments where they use their statistical function. So, for example, cases of um, runaway cultural evolution where prestige and popularity become uncoupled with actual success. And I mean, I think we can all think of good examples. I'm not going to name the names, but I love this quote um, from Michael Sacasas. It is impossible to overstate the degree to which the petty narcissistic type is naturally equipped to command the highest of the attention of the economy. I love Trump and, you know, other, other, uh, demagogues that we are dealing with. Um, it's also the case that you know, amplification of outrage and negativity dilutes its ability to diagnose the types of people and actions that we should be paying attention to and punishing in our environment. If everything is worthy of outrage, effectively nothing is right. And finally, echo chambers, where in-group group bias lead, uh, leads to um, false beliefs about the social world, false consensus effects, false polarization, spirals of science, silence, and so on. Um, so I'm going to next share um, some, some, uh, some new studies from my lab, which illustrate some of these issues, this idea that um, our social knowledge can be distorted through the dynamics that we see um, in terms of the type of information that's amplified by social media. So perception of outrage is, is the focus of this work. Um, we're looking at how people perceive the outrage of other individuals and other groups, and then how those perceptions affect their own attitudes and behaviors. And perception of outrage is important to study because functional democracies require that we all have an accurate shared understanding about one another's moral attitudes on political issues. Now, because social media decouples the expression of outrage, from its experience, you might appear outraged on social media without actually feeling it deeply yourself. And so people who are observing other people's expressions online might falsely believe others are more outraged than they actually are. And exacerbating this problem, as I mentioned earlier, our news feeds are not representative of the entire network, but our minds may, might make inferences as if they are representative. So if you imagine a network, where a minority of individuals express outrage about some issue, but then those posts, because they're angsty, um, get cherry picked by the algorithm and they're more likely to show up in the news feed. So then an individual user might infer that the entire network is more outraged than it actually is. And the individuals within that network are more outraged than they actually are. So to test this, we ran a series of studies on Twitter, and these studies had an author phase and an observer phase. In the author phase, we collected tweets in real time, and then we classified their level of outrage using our classifier. And then we sent direct messages to those authors and asked them to rate how outraged and also how happy they were when they felt uh, when they when they sent the tweet. We then store those tweets and the associated emotion ratings in the database. And then finally, in the observer phase, we show those tweets that we collected to a separate group of participants and ask them to judge how outraged and how happy the author was when they sent the tweet. And what we want to do is then um, actually compare the author's actual emotion ratings about their own tweets 
and compare those with the uh, judgments or the predictions of the observers. And what we find is that the observers consistently judge the authors to be more outraged than the authors themselves report feeling. And this effect is specific to outrage. We don't see it um, for happiness. Um, but we see this across three waves of, of study deployments. And um, also strikingly, the overperception of outrage in the observers is stronger in observers who report the most social media engagement specifically for political content, which suggests that through observational learning, they're learning that outrage is a common response. And it's actually rational for them to infer from an ambiguous signal that um, that users are, are, are more outraged than, than they might actually be. We then, yeah. Uh, when are the authors making statements? Is it like in the moment or is it after the class? The majority are within uh, 20 minutes or so. Yeah. This is a preprint, so you can also read more details. Yeah. Um, so we next then examine the consequences of over perceiving outrage in a series of experiments. Um, so our database is containing tweets that vary in their levels of reported and perceived outrage. So we can take these tweets and create two simulated news feeds. In, um, and in these news feeds, the level of actual outrage reported by the authors of the tweets is identical. But we have two feeds. We have an over-perception feed where the observers are inferring more outrage, and we have an accurate perception feed where the, the author and observer um, reports of the initial match. And then we randomly assign, assign participants in a simulated Twitter environment to scroll through one of these two news feeds. And then we measure the effect uh, on a variety of different measures related to affective polarization and the term of conflict. So what we find is that relative to the accurate perception condition, over perception of outrage increases perceptions of collective outrage in the entire network, increases beliefs about norms of outrage expression in the network. So um, what is what is appropriate to express? Um, polarizes beliefs about the network's feelings towards in group and out group members um, and increases beliefs about the network's ideological strategy. So just to summarize so far, social media algorithms amplify angst content that adaptive social learning biases predispose us to pay attention from, uh, pay attention to and learn from. And these algorithms also exploit observational and social learning processes to teach users to create more of this content themselves. And the worry is that by amplifying social media is creating conditions that might render our social learning biases less adaptive, producing less accurate social knowledge on important political issues um, in the US, which is where we do these experiments. So just like the food industry exploits our preferences for fat and sugar and the modern food environment is uh, you know, leading to, to really unhealthy nutritional uh, situations, um, algorithms might be exploiting preferences uh, for certain types of social content at the expense of environments that facilitate cooperation, collaborative uh, work, mutual understanding, and so on. So what I've presented so far is pretty consistent with the view from Ian Wilson that I shared at the beginning. Um, we seem to be able to explain and understand a lot about the crises that we're currently facing with a model of how social media algorithms exploit well-known human learning biases. And this model should be able to then straightforwardly inform how we design solutions, or in the words of technology activist Rasan Harris, simply put, technology has outmatched our brains, diminishing our capacity to address the world's most pressing challenges. We must bring our godlike technology back into alignment with an honest understanding of our limits. So I agree with this, and in the next part of the talk, I want to introduce a worry that maybe we cannot, in fact, frame the problem this way. In particular, I want to question how well we actually do understand the human mind and how robust our current models will be for predicting the ways that technology will impact our psychology in the future. 
So Wilson and Harris seem to assume what you might call a nativist view of psychology, where our mental processes are genetically inherited and evolve at a pretty glacial pace. Um, as the as the evolutionary psychologist Cosmic is to be famously said, we have stone age minds in modern skulls. This model sort of treats cognition as a fixed target. And to address the problems of technology, we simply need to understand the shape and distance and size of that target. But what if human cognition in the digital age is a moving target? To illustrate a little more about what I mean, here's an excerpt from another blog post about moving social media by the philosopher and cognitive scientist, Sophie Barwich. And she writes, how we define and enact communication becomes our social structure of meaning, its content and creation. In the end, these social enactments of communication further affect and transform ourself. I desire more time to think. Instead of being frequently perplexed by thinking of myself as potentially being thought of, it seems that I judge myself more and more harshly when I spend time on social media. It had become a silent driver of thoughts and attitudes. And I think if anyone here has spent time on social media, like you might know what she's talking about. Like I, I once sort of noticed, uh, I was thinking in tweets. Like I was sort of like observing stuff and sort of thinking, like composing tweets in my head, and like, but like I, I think there's something to this, and I think um, I think that we need to think about it. Um, and this idea that our cultural milieu can shape the way that we think, as well as the contents of our thoughts, um, has been formalized in theoretical work by the cognitive scientist Celia Hayes, uh, whose recent book Cognitive Gadgets argues that for thinking devices imitation, mind reading, language, and others are neither hardwired nor designed by genetic evolution. Instead, she argues, our thinking devices, or what she calls cognitive gadgets, are socially learned and culturally selected. So rather than having certain cognitive instincts from birth, we learn to do things like imitate and read minds through our interactions with other people. And those cognitive processes that are more successful then get transmitted from generation to generation through the process of cultural evolution. So she writes, culture is responsible not just for the grist of the mind, what we do and make, but for fabricating its mills, the very way the mind works. Now, I should say that, that his account is a little bit controversial. Um, she writes these like very like kind of uh, like uh, barnstorming papers that are very, very critical of the interpretations of a lot of empirical work and, and theoretical work. Um, but I think it's a really provocative and interesting idea. And so um, for the rest of my time, I just want to like play with the implications of this idea for how we should think about um, the cultural evolution of normativity in particular with the digital age. And she's written a recent paper focusing on this. Um, so by normativity, I mean the psychological processes we use to think about what is appropriate, allowed, required, or forbidden. And in Hayes' model, it's divided into explicit and implicit processes. And normativity itself, or normative thinking, constitutes three kinds of behavior, um, compliance, enforcement, and um, commentary. So the actions that constitute compliance with norms and enforcement of those norms within a society are defined by a commentary within that society language. We talk about it. Um, and they don't depend on any sort of inherited or specialized psychological processes. Um, so implicit normativity in the model um, is something that's operating in early childhood, um, where commentary is absent because children are not quite uh, developing uh, deep linguistic capacities. Um, compliance and enforcement are depending on implicit domain general learning processes, um, a kind of genetic server kits for mature social cognition. And um, these processes help us learn from others about all sorts of things, including norms. As we get older, um, the explicit processes kick in, um, and um, commentary plays a really important role in sort of reasoning and not mentalizing and sort of. Um, developing the capacity for rule-based thought about what's appropriate, what's allowed, what's required or forbidden. Um, and these processes are, of course, um, shaped by cultural selection. Um, so the model really uh, assigns a central role to 
social and heritage or culture in the development of not just the content of norms, but also the psychological mechanisms we use to think about norms themselves. So we don't just learn from people in our social group and from cultural um, inheritance that something like marrying your cousin is not allowed. Um, we also learn from other people how to think about norms in general, how to feel about norm violations. We learn to represent norms as a distinctive kind of regularity in the social world and emotions that are appropriate for responding to uh, norm violations. So the model has some interesting implications when we consider that commentary, which is playing a really important role in this model, um, is happening a lot on social media. Um, and as we saw in the first part of the talk, social media algorithms amplify normative content in ways that seem to uh, alter the, the function of those uh, social learning biases. So to, to sort of wrap things up, I want to highlight three features of social media that might be shaping or interacting with the cultural evolution of normativity. And those include incentives for, for, for particular types of normative thinking, um, interactions with new types of agents and audiences that we socially interact with, and also the speed and scale of communications afforded by the structure of online social networks. So beyond incentivizing products, um, algorithms might incentivize other sorts of normative thinking. This is all very speculative, um, just to, to give you an example. So for example, um, simplified narratives that have a clear villain and a clear victim might generate more engagement and nuance accounts. And in fact, the affordances of a platform like Twitter don't actually allow you to go into much detail. Um, so people might be learning over time to communicate and maybe even cognitively represent and understand moral situations in ways that essentialize moral character, which in turn we know from, from psychological research, um, moral essentialism is not helpful for cooperation, uh, for forgiveness, for learning, and so on. There's also evidence that um, social media algorithms disproportionately incentivize and spread right-wing over left-wing content um, in the U.S. And one possibility is that in doing so, there's also an encouragement or an internalization of right-wing styles of thinking about norms, like, for example, parochialism. Um, and finally, because um, social media algorithms disproportionately incentivize criticism towards outgroup members, um, making people quicker to blame and assume the worst about people outside their group, um, this might actually, over time, sort of reinforce and increase attention to social identity as a contributor towards moral judgments, even if social identity is irrelevant to the situation at hand. Um, and so if this is happening, then this dynamic uh, risks reinforcing the, the types of negative outcome meta perceptions that we know exacerbate social conflicts. A second consequential feature of social media is how um, it changes the nature of our social interactions. Um, so reputation management, of course, is a crucial aspect of social and moral cognition. Um, and social media has this weird feature um, that's, that's called context collapse. So the intended audience might not end up being the, multi, the ultimate audience for your content. Um, because once you tweet something, for example, someone else can retweet and show it to different networks and you don't have any control over where that goes. So one possibility is that people are gonna develop increasingly sophisticated reputation management and mentalizing strategies to deal with the fact that the audience that is in front of you or the audience that you imagine might not be the ultimate audience for whatever it is going to say to you. Um, also relevant to the work in this group, um, we might need to develop new kinds of social cognition and mentalizing uh, machines or machine human interfaces. So how are we going to be thinking about um, attributing motives, responsibility for networks of individuals, uh, for machines, for machine human uh, hybrids and so on. So I think there's just like a wealth of questions for uh, psychology and technology in this space. Um, and then also the question of whether the, the types of moral thinking that are encouraged in online environments could then spill back into our offline interactions with them. All right, I'm wrapping up here um, very soon. Um, so the last point I'll talk about is sort of the speed and scale of communication afforded by social media. 
Um, and um, the idea is that um, there, there seem to be just like faster sort of cycling of um, normative commentary and feedback. And um, this is, I think, pretty overwhelming. Um, and to deal with this kind of information overload, we might be developing new ways to think about social norms in these environments. So I'm going to give a couple of examples. Um, hopefully this. Um, so the tech critic, um, Michael Sakakis, who's a really brilliant thinker on all this stuff, um, observed that social media, perhaps Twitter especially, accelerate both the rate at which we consume information and the rate at which ensuing discussion detaches from the issue at hand, turning into metadata about how we respond to the responses of others, etc. Um, and this leads to positions of uh, like anti, anti, anti vax. Um, I so over so it's so the idea that um, you know, during the pandemic, conservatives were not so it's not so much anti-vax as anti-pro-vax, and more generally, this sort of anti-anti position seems to be increasingly common, and um, sprouts um, from our intergroup conflicts. So the historian uh, Kevin Baker uh, observed uh, a lot of irritating, mostly vapid people and ideas. We're able to build huge followings in the 2010s because of people criticizing them were even worse. And Sakakis goes on to observe if we are, in fact, inhabiting a media ecosystem that, through sheer scale and ubiquity, heightens our awareness of all that is wrong with the world and overwhelms free digital habits of sense making and crisis management, meta positioning might be more charitably framed as a survival mechanism. And maybe the meta positioning habit of mind is what happens when I have a clearer sense of what I'm against than what I'm for. So a growing awareness of this rapid cycling of normative commentary um, might in turn lead to cynical beliefs. So for example, observing how certain types of viral normative commentary can grow somebody's audience and reputation might um, promote the belief that people are primarily expressing their beliefs on social media in order to boost their reputation, to virtue signal, regardless of what they actually do. This has become a really popular um, argument um, on the right, especially uh, to try to sort of uh, dismiss um, arguments about social justice. And uh, this rapid cycling of normative commentary in a system that is built to reward outrage um, can get pretty weird. So yesterday I was browsing Twitter instead of writing this talk and um, I saw this tweet. Um, All right, folks, it's time. What was the most commonly on my discourse? We saw this year. Mine's got to be chopping tomatoes is elitist. And someone replied, oh, my favorite moment was that monster who has coffee with her husband in the mornings. And lots of people knew what this was. Um, this is a tweet that generated a viral outrage pile on. The argument was that not everyone is able to have the time to have coffee in the garden. It was like, it was a big thing. Um, and uh, another another reply, um, two cooking discourses this year were fine by themselves, but only truly transcended when you realize they follow each other almost immediately. People having to simultaneously defend against eating out of restaurants as elitists and also knowing how to cook as elitist uh, simultaneously in this political. So you can sort of see the, the absurdity of the discourse that can evolve on these platforms such that two opposite types of behaviors, eating out of restaurants and cooking for yourself are both elitist. And like, you know, if, if you if you think this is like amusing, um, like I was chuckling at this, but then it sort of dawned on me that it's actually like really not funny because I worry that these cycles of what you might call absurd outrage can license the rejection of legitimate outrage by our interests who want to escape the accountability for actual harms. And more broadly, then these kinds of observations and the meta discourse about social media and the incentives that it gives um, could encourage something like like normal normative violence, um, concluding that you know, modern morality has lost any meaningful function, and so retreating to more traditional norms that they perceive to be more legitimate. 
and his back backlash against moral progress can be seen in discourses that dismiss legitimate outrage about social injustices as woke ideology. Um, I think mean, that's very, very popular on the right. It dominates the rhetoric of um, uh, Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, is uh, thought to be the likely Republican presidential nominee. So we're in a really dangerous time, and I think it's more urgent than ever to understand how our digital technologies might be changing the way we think about norms in addition to the content of those norms themselves. Okay. So to summarize, um, social media algorithms exploit social learning biases in ways that can be making them less adaptive. Um, they might be shaping the transmission of not just the content of social norms, but also how we think of and feel about social norms in general. And so I think as a field, we should be thinking about not just how social media is exploiting and shaping existing cognitive mechanisms and biases, but also might be creating new ones. And, and I'll, I'll just I'll just sign off with one of my favorite quotes um, with this reference in the title of the talk from the author Arndi Roy, who's commenting on the pandemic. Um, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew, and this one's no different. Portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our database and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk lightly with little luggage ready to imagine another world. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we're in this moment of volatility, innovation, and transformation. And we increasingly have the tech technical capacities to imagine and create new digital worlds. And the way that we design these digital spaces, um, their affordances, their incentives, and the communities have the capacity to influence uh, the way that we approach these crises that we're dealing with. Um, and so I hope that we will all continue to work on this um, and, and think about um, how we and technologies are increasingly influencing one another. So thank you so much for that. And uh, we'll take questions and comments. And um, oh, thank you to all my collaborators. And once again, if there's my email address, please send me relevant papers to these topics because we're writing a big review right now and uh, I want to say your work. Thank you.